And bear with me, I'm quite nervous. So, one sec. My first poem is a short one. It's called Try. The fire escape I'm sitting on is giving way. And when I grasp for something to break my fall, there's only these sounds that scorch my skin. I tried to love you, but I can't. Why did I take you to my favorite place for you to pour this gasoline on the ground? There's no quelling this fire now. I tried to love you, but I can't. It's worse than not just being, than just not being loved. To know you tried, like that's a consolation. It's the smoke that stings my eyes, obstructing my vision. I tried to love you, but I can't. I'm sitting on this collapsing fire escape while you're safe on the ground, looking up at me, waiting for me to tell you, it's okay, I understand. This is um, apparently an untitled piece. I haven't read this publicly before. The day before, Anna dyed my hair. Her fingers were stained with the red box dye she violently combed through my hair. She complained about how quickly my long hair tangled and worried about having enough time to ready her Halloween costume. The entire time she was quietly humming and dancing to the pop songs coming from my phone. Some of the crimson dye dripped from her hand down onto the dorm rug, leaving a stain. We tried to hide it with a chair. When you dye your hair, you have to wash the excess dye out. When you dye your hair red, you shower in a crime scene. <laughs> the shower walls are splattered with red and pink, and blood-colored water drips down your body to the drain. When you dye your hair red, you wash your hands over and over, like a cosmetic Lady Macbeth. <laughs> the red keeps coming out with multiple washes. For the next two weeks, you feel like a horror movie. <laughs> At 4.40 a.m. the next morning, Anna came into my room, pale and crutch clutching her wrist. Red dripped down from her wrist onto the carpet. She was crying and hyperventilating, about to collapse from blood loss. When someone cuts their wrist too deep, there isn't just blood, so much blood. You can see the layer of fat beneath the skin. You can see the pulse. You feel the pulse against your hand that's putting a washcloth and pressure on the wrist. That pulse slows down as your own, pounding in your head, speeds up. Anna argued with me when she wasn't fading out of consciousness. No hospital, no hospital. Her skin got gray as mine turned red. When she finally went to the hospital with another friend, I couldn't breathe. I washed my hands over and over without looking at them, only stopping when they began to feel raw. Then I finally gave myself permission to collapse. I slept for 48 hours, awoke feeling unclean. I tried to shower and broke down crying in the corner. I sobbed with my eyes screwed shut, trying to hide from the color of my hair dripping down my body. The day before she nearly died, Anna dyed my hair. Oh. So this poem was written, it's technically nonfiction, technically a poem, it really depends who you ask. <laughs> um, it's called 2% Chance of Extreme Agony. <laughs> the first hint something is wrong is the episodes in which I wake up writhing, unable to speak. The second is when the bleeding won't stop. I still wait three months to tell anyone. Insurance companies are cruel and fickle things. When you get an IUD, they read you your vaginal Miranda rights. One is a 2% chance of expulsion. An IUD expulsion sounds like the device ejects itself, a fighter pilot hitting the parachute button. <laughs> this is inaccurate. It's actually the device deciding to wander. It can twist, scrape, peripherate. It can embed, stab, rip. It can do all this and a plethora of other violent words. None of, them, none of them are things I want happening inside me, inside my womb. 
All I want in my uterus is an action and silence. The most violent word the IUD can decide to be, ineffective. The speculum is cold and shoved abruptly inside. It spreads me open like a coin purse about to be rooted around in. I have not been sedated. The nurse looks at me and softly says that I can curse, scream, cry, wail, pass out, everything, but please don't kick them in the face. <laughs> she assures me childbirth is worse. My doctor nods and rubs her round belly absentmindedly. Then she sits between my legs. Glorified pliers plunge into me. Both the IUD and my silent screams are wrenched from my body. I smell copper and latex and tears. I push against the stirrups of the table. My body twists, searching for escape. The lengths I go to to not have kids. Just as the pain subsides enough for me to open my eyes, my doctor returns. I didn't know she left. In her palm is a little T-piece shape of metal with a string. It looks like a minimalist charm of a fallopian tube. <laughs> it looks small and cruel, and I cannot leave without it. We take the plunge inside me. The screams aren't silent this time. I can't stop the convulsing or the cursing or the screams for my mother. I focus on not kicking my pregnant gynecologist. My body does not want to be alive. It's done. I can feel it between my hips, an intrusion in the deepest part of me. Pain pulses into my vision. My doctor stands up. She's saying something. All I catch through the ha pulsing haze is that 2% has gone up to 20. Oh. Mm. Thank you.